Welcome um, to Irrigation Basics with Clint Adams. This should be the best training session you've ever had in your lives. <laughs> It's a promise, money back guarantee. You've all got packs in front of you. I might refer to them as we're going. So um, the, kind, the kind of the, the tools that you're gonna need as an irrigation installer um, residentially is pretty much a shovel, cutters, multi-grips or cobra clamp tools. Um, I just assume most of you have got multi-grips in your kit. A lot of you might not be aware of the cobra clamp tool. You've got that, so that's for the stainless steel clamps. I don't know, the, these ones here. They're used more predominantly on vineyards, kind of thing. They should be used for a lot of residential. They are being used more for residential, so a lot of the... They're better than, I find them better than plastic clips. Most? Yeah. <laughs> Lately, I'll get a bag of 100 plastic clips and 15 of them are fucked. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. most landscapers now have just gone to the point where they're going, a poly clip costs me 20 or 30 cents and a metal clip costs me 80 or 90 cents, but I don't want to drive that 40 minutes back to that client's house to fix one clip. Um, and, and they're starting to make decisions that aren't just based on the bottom line. Probably more our client based than other clients. Um, there are still probably people out there that are just like, I don't care, I'm gonna do it as cheap as I can and I just won't go back. So um, our, our customers tend to be more there than there. So um, those, those clamps, are just, they just have to be um, done up with a different tool, which crushes the, the I guess, the teeth over the teeth. So. Uh, and then they can be taken apart using the same tool. Yeah. So if you've put them on wrong, yeah, I'll leave. I'll let you guys have a shot at that further in. Yep. <laughs> the normal ones are the the Toro ones. You can kind of get apart. Um, so they're a normal clamp. They're the market leading clamp, and you can use that tool. So we'll do. I'll get some pipe, and you guys can have a shot with these. So you, once you've closed it over, like it'll go over like that, and then you just basically using that to pop it back open so it, it bites into the into the side and it just takes it back off so they can be um, the plastic clamps can be reused as well the plastic clamps that we stock here are made by Antelco which are a manufacturer in Murray Bridge so you, you, they're a lot better quality clip than maybe something that you might buy at a Mitre 10 or a Bunnings in saying that you're buying your clips here I'm guessing the majority of them okay yeah, so if the, the plastic that these guys use, like you can see it, oh, okay, I'll tip these out. Um, it's just a really a really sharp plastic. So if you look at the T, I, I wouldn't have any of, our, of their competitors' fittings to compare them to, but if you have a look at the how sharp they're getting these barbs, it's much different to, um, say, a hardware shop fitting. So if you have a look at the, feel how sharp they are. It's, it's because of the plastic that they're using. The other plastics that are out there, so this is, oh, this is, okay, so this is a different manufacturer. So if you have a look at the different plastic, yeah. it's marginally different, but the barb's not quite as strong. Nah, that's it. Yeah. They, it's, it's a cheaper way to make fittings, those ones there. So uh, we choose to sell Antelco. We're quite lucky um, that because the irrigation's quite an airy product that the majority of the things that we choose to sell are made in South Australia or Victoria, um, and we can bring them in. It's really only when we get into the kind of valves and controllers that we start looking at products from overseas, because obviously Mexico and China, are, you know, we can't compete with them as far as manufacturing goes. Yeah. So that's me going off track before we've even started, but let's get started. So um, if anyone needs to go to the toilet during this presentation, just go. I'm not fancy with stuff like that. If you need to go home, just go home. I'm not gonna cry about it if you wanna drink. Just go grab one. Um, if you've got questions along the way, please feel free to ask them. So at the start, um, when you're um, doing an irrigation system, it's like anything else in life. If you don't plan it properly, thank you, Matt, um, you're gonna have trouble from the start. So the main uh, thing you wanna be doing is working out um, the area that you wanna irrigate first, getting the flow and the pressure that uh, you have available on site and then making a plan. Now. As clients of WaterPro, you could use our services to get a free irrigation design and quote done, or you could learn how to do it yourself over a period of time. And um, so I'll draw, I'll do some basic, um, I guess, a plan. So a lot, a lot of the times, sorry, we got people, a lot of the times we'll have someone um, bringing in a, a house plan where they'll have lawns out the front with a garden bed down the side. This is just a very stereotypical uh, kind of, um, I'm not a landscape designer, so that's a driveway. Uh, and then a house, and then a back lawn. So the things that we need to know 
uh, or that anyone that you're dealing with is going to need to know when uh, they're looking at doing uh, an irrigation design, uh, what's lawn and what's garden. So obviously the green being lawn and we'll use red for garden. And uh, the location of the water source, the flow that the water source is delivering, the pressure that it's delivering at some times, and where they're gonna put an irrigation controller. So whether or not that controller can go on a wall or if it's gonna have to be met, put outside of, uh, I guess, the house because you've got concrete. So if there was concrete paths already here uh, and, they needed to, and they had water out here and water here, you'd be using battery operated valves, which I'll go through a bit later on. It's ideal if we can use mains pressure controllers, uh, sorry, mains electricity controllers as a priority, obviously, because you're not replacing batteries. You've got that option of connecting Wi-Fi so that you can start programming the controllers from away from where you are. So we'll have a client bring in a picture of that like that, and we'll say how much flow uh, is that water delivering? And the answer is usually, I don't know, but it's pretty good. So unfortunately, we can't work with that. Um, we need an actual number. If we don't get a number, we'll usually work on about 20 litres a minute as a safe flow for metropolitan South Australia. And then we'll give you a plan and say, look, that's where we should be putting the sprinklers. So, um, you know, we'll say there's MP rotators in each corner of these lawns because these lawns are four metres square. We know that those MPs are using one and a half litres each. So there's, you know, uh, three, six, so there's 12 litres a minute across those two because we've got the data that tells us that. So we'd say that's 12 litres a minute there. That's going to be pretty similar. Put that on a valve, that on a valve, and the front garden on a valve and the back garden on a valve. Most people are happy with that. There'd be enough water on a situation like that to operate the front and back gardens together. It's just people don't want to do it because then you're going to be running a 25 mil poly or a 19 mil poly all the way down there, most likely under concrete or pavers, and it's low density and it's potentially going to um, blow or tear or there's a risk. So they'd then get a probably a four they'd need a four station controller we'd recommend choosing a six obviously as a safety or uh, having a, an expandable controller like the rainbird espme there's not a hunter expandable the pro c i guess but not residentially so the great thing about us doing a design in the early stages is that if your information doesn't change what we give you will work and it won't change so you could safely go well we're only ever going to use four zones the whole backyard's fully landscaped. There's never gonna be a garden or veggie patch or whatever. The only variable that comes into play then is if the water source that's being delivered into your property changes because you're not, uh, what are they called now? You, did I say water? Who's, what's it, United? What's the other one? Who fixes the pipes? The other company, but anyway. If that water pressure gets turned down because um, they've had issues with people's things blowing, so a lot of the new appliances that have been sold into new areas now have need to be under 500 kPa, otherwise you would, um, the solenoid valves in your dishwashers are going to blow or the tapware that you've got for your showers are going to blow. So they're not as strong as they used to be. Um, so there's obviously that 500 kPa. You've probably seen or done it before where you can uh, test your water source available by filling up a bucket and timing it. Have you guys, have you, you've done that, you'd be doing that. Someone's doing it, have you done that? So that's to get us an absolute raw liters per minute thing. So we'll get a bucket, which I don't have any here. That's right, don't worry about it. So we'll turn a tap right on, have it completely pumping, stick a bucket underneath it and time how long that bucket takes to fill up. And then the seconds and the liters come back to water pro. So most people are carrying kind of nine or 20 liter buckets. Um, and then they're gonna say, you know, the nine liters in, we are usually kind of getting 12, 18 seconds. And then obviously 20 in kind of like 30 to 40 seconds, which gives us um, say 20, around 27 to 30 litres a minute. Yeah, 30. Um, when we get that flow, we take, we factor that down. So we will only probably design to 80% of that as a safety. Uh, obviously you've got water moving through pipes. You've got um, situations on site changing where you might've tested the water flow when there was no one home and the irrigation cycle was going while a shower is being used or a dishwasher is being used or whatever. We'd try to program it so that doesn't work, but it's important for us to not have it, I guess, revving out all the way um, because you, there's going to be times where it might change. Residentially, we don't always ask for a pressure. So pressure and flow are two different things. Flow is liters per minute and pressure is measured in either KPA or PSI or whatever your standard pressure measurements are. 
most houses have a 500 kPa fixed pressure reducer at the start of the house now. Some landscapers and irrigators will be taking the water before that so that they can ensure that they're getting six or 800 kPa or whatever the house traditionally had. If you're doing a takeoff from a tap out the back here and running you know, a, a riser down a blue line into the back, you're gonna be getting the 500 kPa pressure reduced flow plus whatever you've lost through the house plus whatever you're losing out of the tap and then you've got water out the back. So in some suburbs, we might not be getting 300 kPa of pressure at a house. When it starts getting dancing in that 300 and 200 bracket, it gets to a point where sprinklers aren't gonna pop up or they're not gonna work while they're popped up. So uh, it's probably safe for most of you to just do a flow test and bring it in here. And then we do the irrigation design and, and you know it's gonna work. If you uh, wanna hedge your bets and be really safe about it, we've got a pressure testing kit that you can borrow, which we don't have here. Have you got one of them somewhere? Um, which you can basically screw this onto your tap, have the water passing through the pipe and the pressure gauge while you're filling up the bucket. So you can actually say that you filled up a bucket at 250 or 350 kPa, or you can test your static. So your static pressure is the pressure when the valve's closed. So that's what your house is, when all the taps are off, that's how much pressure's in your pipe. And then we get kind of a, a, a variance of those. So. Commercially, if we were asking someone for a, we'd probably ask them for say a 300 kPa and a 500 kPa and a static. And they'd come back to us and go, look, the static was 850 um, at 500 kPa. We were able to get 120 liters a minute. Um, and then at 300, we would be getting say one, 180, I think it works that way. It might not be that different, but it, that, that don't use these as, as figures, but just as an understanding of what we're looking at. So then we'll graph that flow and then it can help us determine how much pressure, well, how much flow will be available to us at say 400 or 380 or whatever it might be. Sprinklers and drippers, and I don't want to go too deep into this because it's not stuff that you probably need to know from a day to day, but just so you've got an understanding of why we're asking. Without those pressures, we can't determine what the spring, how the sprinklers are going to react and whether or not you might need pressure reducers on your sprinkler systems, which is probably something you guys aren't thinking about, or to have pressure regulating stems on the sprinkler shafts themselves to ensure that sprinklers like MP rotators and R vans, which are the ones, well, the MP rotators are probably the ones that you're most familiar with now in the current climate. They don't behave how they're meant to behave unless they're being delivered the correct amount of pressure. So the flow is fine. You've got enough flow, but if there's 500 kPa coming into a, an MP rotator, you won't be able to adjust it. So the distance that it's throwing won't be able to be brought down and then you'll be go, going, well, it says it can adjust to 20% of its total throw. It's not working, why? It's because you've got too much pressure going into it. So if we get all this information right at the start, we can give you an estimate for the materials required and a, and a design and then you know that you can go to your client and price that job. You're not gonna be caught out, you're not gonna be missing any parts um, and that you're able to confidently deliver them the similar kind of conversation that I'm having with you now and saying, we've done a flow test, we've done a pressure test, um, we've had a preliminary irrigation design, this is what it looks like, we're not leaving it with you because that's obviously our IP. This is my price, obviously your price that you decide to charge the client and then they can say yes or no and you know that you can go do the job. You win the job, you ring us, we've won it, cool, get it packed up, let's go. I'll quickly just cover this off. So this is a pressure um, testing kit that we've got, so that would be the water going in there. We close this all the way for a static measurement. So that would just give us a, a number on that gauge and that tells us the static. And then we open that ball valve until this gauge drops to the pressure that we're trying to measure. So you might open it and you'll see the gauge drop from 800 down to 400 and the gauge will just be sitting there at 400. Then this is a digital flow meter. So we just use this. We just reset that and it will just measure the amount of water that's passing through this meter real time. So you'll be like, oh cool, 400. 32 liters a minute, yep, we've got it, that's a number, we can take that back to WaterPro and, and they can work with it. We're testing water with this up at Mount Barker in the kind of 200, 300 liters a minute capacity. So residentially, you'll never outwork this thing. So um, as customers of WaterPro, if you need to, you can borrow this, take it to site. We'll just basically, we put it on a sales order, you borrow it, bring it back, we delete the sales order and you've been able to use it. Yep. For guys doing a lot of irrigation, we've got customers buying these. How much are they? Uh, 170 yeah, so it's 170 bucks. So it's, it's a tool that you might say, well, it's good, but we don't need it that much. We can come and borrow it from WaterPro as we need, or that's up to you. I'm not, nothing we do here is about me selling you stuff. I never, ever want you to walk out of here feeling like you've been sold anything. So um, it's here to use for free if you need to. 
So you've had your irrigation design done, you've got all your stuff. Um, I'll work from the controller out so that we kind of follow some kind of system with the way I'm talking to everyone. So we'll assume that you've purchased a, a wall mount controller, right? So uh, residentially, sorry for drinking coffee while I'm talking to you, I haven't had one today. Um, we would use a half mil squared multi-core cable from the controller. So um, I'll pass that around for you guys to have a look at. So the half mil squared refers to the size of the copper that's inside those sheets. When you're sending electricity from a controller out to a solenoid valve, it needs to get there, same as water. And if your cable's too small, the voltage won't get to the solenoid coil and then it won't be able to pop up the solenoid coil and the valve won't be able to actuate. Half mil copper will be good residentially. So we saw them, the biggest roll we saw them in on the, ca uh, off, on the floor is 100 metres. You could run that straight 100 metres from here to the valves and it will work. Once you're getting out to 120, you're starting to push it. Um, and the next size up from that's one mil. And I reckon we did some maths on that the other day. It was about 272 for one mil with one and a half mil common or two and a half mil common. I'll talk about common as well. For you guys, you'll only be using this unless you've got a job at Handorf and you're doing an acre and you need to get it from the homestead to each corner. We'll help you size that. It's more just understanding it. Like most of the things that you won't know, you can come and ask us. I think it's just important that you go home knowing that you need to not, you need to ask those questions. So you need to know how far the further solenoid valve is going to be from the controller. Where are the where's the controller going to be? How's the homeowner going to want to op operate that controller? Are they even going to want to have anything to do with it, or are they just going to say, "You're looking after our backyard now. We don't ever want to hear about it. If it breaks, you fix it. We want you to just come and know." So that's where you've got your Wi-Fi and everything else. So you mount your controller on the wall, and this is something you spoke about before about the whole cable out. So a controller will have a common. A master valve, can you see that really? I might go darker. A common, a master valve, and then say one, two, three, four, and so on. Residentially, our controllers are, most common controller we would sell would be a four station controller. Is that still true? I haven't worked in it for a while. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, we can sell you, so the Rainbird ESPME expands out to 22. I can't see anyone doing residential jobs above 22 valves. Like even that Handorf example that I just came up with might be 18 or 20. So you'll need to then run cable from those ports out to a solenoid valve. So this is a manifold that we've made up and I'll, we can have a play here later. I'll show you how we've kind of set this up and why. So this is just a two station manifold with its ball valve and its backflow prevention. And each of these cables has, each of these valves have two cables coming from them, right? Solenoid valves that operate from a 24 volt AC controller, which are all the wall mounted controllers that we've got that plug into a wall, are alternating current. So the polarity of these cables doesn't matter. So you, whichever way you wire this up, it's not gonna matter. Nine volt DC solenoid coils have a polarity issue and that's why there's a red cable and a black cable. And then if you join, like I say, a Hunter node to a Hunter PGV with a DC coil, the red goes to the red, the black goes to the black. For this, it doesn't matter. The one that I just hooked up recently, the first one I've ever hooked up, had an on and off. So it didn't matter which way, which, so the on I put to common and off I went to one. The valve had an on and an off. Yeah, it said on and off on the top of the actual. Oh, that's, okay. That's a manual, the on and off that you're reading is a manual arrows, right? So I'll go to this and then I'll come back. All solenoid valves can be turned on manually. You don't have to use cable to do it. What you're doing manually is actuating the valve by simulating what this does. So the way a valve works is it sends electricity through these cables. There's an electromagnet inside this coil. This is called the coil, which is the bit that sits on top of the valve. The electromagnet is sending electricity back and forth, back and forth, and it holds the pin up. So the pin's actually lifting and dropping repeatedly fast, enough that it stays up. So, cause the magnet's kind of going on, off, on, off. When you turn this a quarter turn, it's simulating that magnet lifting. So the on off you're referring to was actually the, the on and off on the coil. The on off. Okay. So, so on is turn it that way, off is turn it that way. I thought there was a little lug a little bit further down and that's how you manually. Also does that. Yeah. So the lug you're referring to is um, a bleed screw, yeah. which is next to it. Yeah. 
the bleed screw releases the air above the bonnet and then that'll like bleed uh, any debris or dirt out of the valve it'll also change the pressure so the, the whole way these work is that there's pressure pumping pushing on them when that pin lifts or when you take that bleed screw out you release the pressure and the water then pushes the diaphragm down and off it goes when you close it it does the opposite of that so it changes the pressure and it closes that's why you'll hear the valve take some time it'll kind of go and then it's like because it's building that pressure back up and turning back off you can do it this way or you can do it that way if you do it this way less water is going to squirt into your valve box so by taking the bleed screw out you're going to have water squirting out the whole time and then your valve box is going to fill up with water and you you don't you, it's probably fine to do that to genuinely bleed the valve so to get any debris that might have got in there out manually do use this if you can ideally just use it automatically so um, so you've run your cables out uh, you can choose to put your cable in conduit or not uh, a lot of people don't put these in conduit they've obviously got the red sheath around them uh, we, we sell red cable, it doesn't matter what colour cable you buy. Most shops have kind of standardised to red now, but you've probably seen blue and green throughout the travels when you're digging up other people's gardens. This cable, uh, the sheath will eventually deteriorate in the sun, so if it's not buried, um, if it's on a wall, then you'd be putting it in conduit. The cables come in a 3-core, a 5-core, a 7-core, a 9-core and a 13-core. You need the number of valves plus 1, so the common is the plus 1. In Australia, or in South Australia, or from what I can tell with all of my Facebook groups that I'm in, we use black as a common, and in the US they tend to use white as a common. I've always used black, it's really up to you what you guys use. The reason that I used black and that a lot of people use black is that if you're coming back and troubleshooting a job or you're doing fault finding work on someone else's site, you know that the common has, it's likely it's been black. If you're not sure, you go to the controller, there's a good chance black's going to be wired into the common and then you know that when you get out to the valves if if the both valves aren't wired to black and one of them's not working it's because it's not wired to the common so that comes down to that troubleshooting i used to go in alphabetical order of the colors from valve one through four or six or eight uh, everyone has their own system like it doesn't really matter there's no law around it it's just if you can start to get some kind of standardization within your business especially when you've got more than one person doing it um you might have another person i'm not sure <laughs> But if you do that, then you can go, all right, valve two's not working. And then your guys know that that's brown because it's the second alphabetical color along the way. Um, for what you're doing, Billy, it's not really, you don't need to get involved, like you don't need to design this in, like it's just, um, so yeah. So what will happen is you'll wire them into the controller. Um, so you'll have kind of your common wire going out. So we'll just work on two valves for now. So those two valves have two cables coming off their coils they are coils uh, and so that common wire needs to join to one of each of the valves and then you're joining cable number one to valve number one and cable number two to the other cable from valve number two does that make sense any questions about that you want to be joining those wires using waterproof connectors and making sure that any exposed copper is not exposed when you leave that house so if you only used three of these cables i would be getting the other four and either shoving them all in a wire joiner or a heat shrink and closing them off or individually capping them in case you're going to come back and just use one of them uh, as soon as water starts to ingress on this copper it starts to de deteriorate and it's going to reduce the quality of your irrigation system Maybe not enough that it's going to bother you in the next five or ten years, but it's best practice to be closing them off. Um, and also best practice that your wire joins. If you've got, say, a gel connector, you've got your plastic is so deep into the gel that the, there's no copper exposed. So obviously these boxes are going to get full of water at some point and they're out in the air. Even if they're not getting wet, they're, they're exposed to moisture in the air and they'll start to deteriorate um, and you don't want that. So if you've done all that properly, you program your controller it turns on valve one. What it's doing then is it's taking your 240 volt current, it's transforming it down to 24 volt alternating current, and it's sending an alternating current down the common and whatever valve's being asked to turn on. So when valve one's on, valve two is actually getting the common half of the current or the, of the circuit coming down it, but it's not closing the circuit with the other half. So it's just doing those two. And then that coil pops up, valve works, 
as soon as that gets broken, so if that gets broken because someone hits it with a shovel or the electricity goes off at the house, that valve will close. So if the power goes off mid irrigation cycle, your system will turn off because the solenoid valve needs that cont continuous pulse of electricity to hold the coil up or it turns off. The opposite is the case for a nine volt latching solenoid, so a Hunter node. If they, if the battery happened to mysteriously run flat after turning on, it won't turn off. The likelihood of that is ridiculously low, that a battery will go flat mid-cycle, but um, just more to highlight how they work. So the, the nine volt coil lifts the pin and it locks, so it latches it open, and then the signal sends another signal back to close it. That's why polarity is an issue, um, because it's, it's not a continuous current, it's actually switching it on and off. That's from controller to valves. So obviously controllers, I'm not gonna go into detail about controllers. Um, it's important for you to know that you can get expandable controllers, you can get indoor and outdoor controllers. We don't stock really any indoor controllers anymore because the price difference between indoor and outdoor became so small that it was irrelevant. The advantage of having an outdoor controller is that you don't have a transformer external to the controller. So the transformer actually sits inside behind the door. So when you're running your plug out, all you're doing is basically plugging a cord in like you would a kettle rather than a big transformer and that kind of tiny cable going into the bottom of, a, of an indoor controller. Uh, you can get them expandable from four out to 22. Commercially, we can go out to 200 stations with a decoder system. I won't go through that today. Uh, what else? There's 50% of the controllers that we're probably selling now are Wi-Fi compatible or come with Wi-Fi as a standard. So the Rainbird controller has a Wi-Fi dongle that we can add to the controller to make it a Wi-Fi controller, which is a good thing for you if you want to be competitive in the market. If the client says, look, I don't want it to be Wi-Fi, but I might later, you can price a, a Rainbird controller and they can put a dongle in later. If you buy a, an Orbit Beehive controller, it's got the Wi-Fi functionality in the controller already. So you're paying for that whether or not you're using it or not. And then the Hunter HydroWise obviously has the Wi-Fi compatibility feature in it already. So you're paying for that regardless. When you buy an irrigation controller between the Orbit, the Rainbird and the Hunter, they all have different features. That's a conversation that I suggest you have with our staff or whoever you're dealing with at the time. Um, but it's important to know if your clients are gonna want to um, be able to monitor local weather stations, whether or not they want to have a flow sensor. Um, so the Hunter HydroWise can have a flow sensor at the start and it measures the amount of water that's going through and it knows what each station should be doing. So if one of those station peaks and starts delivering double the amount of water that it's been told to, the controller will learn, will know and it will say there's a problem with valve number one. Obviously a sprinkler's missing or someone's ripped the pipe open, it's been vandalized because 40 litres a minute is heading there when it should be 20 and then you can get an email report back to you as a contractor. So we've got a hunter training night, like you, you're probably not ready for another training night, you haven't even finished this one. But there's a training event in June on the 5th at the Kent Town, so it's a bit more, it's, it'll be warmer and it won't be delivered by me, so it might be better. Um, so um, Lynn's coming down, she's our hunter product manager for the whole country. Well, she's not the product manager, but she's like the, she's the hunter person for that, for our level of communication. You guys did one recently, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Similar to that, I'm, I'm trying to change it up so that it's a little bit more, not you sit there and listen for an hour and a half, but there's products all over the room. You walk around, have a play with it. And if you need her to help, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've just, I've identified that that's a better way. Even this, I don't, the fact that you're sitting down this much would annoy me if I was having to listen. So I like to be, all right, do you want to have a shot with the clamps? Do you want to have a shot with this? Do you want to do that? because it's how I learn, so I'd rather teach that way. Some stuff we just have to do. Um, but if anyone's interested in that, you, I'm assuming you're all in that Facebook trade community or that how you might have heard about it. We'll keep posting stuff in there. It's the best way we've found to communicate real time, even with regards to car parking and all that kind of thing. So, um, But then Lynn will go into detail about uh, MP rotators, how they're adjusted, the features of the Hunter HydroWise and that kind of thing. You've bought your controller, you've got your valves in now, when we're doing the design side of your irrigation system, we're going to be talking to you about drip tube and sprinklers for gardens or lawns. So you could use sprinklers in your garden and sprinklers in your lawn. You could use drip tube in your garden and drip tube in your lawn. It's completely up to you about, uh, I guess, how you want to do it. The only subsurface drip tube that the market's kind of putting in now that's comfortable that they're comfortable with are the Net is the Netafem XR product, which is a copper sulfate impregnated dripper that's designed for roots to be burnt off effectively from the copper sulfate. Um, it's used in almond groves quite successfully as a root intrusion inhibitant dripper. 
Uh, if you were going to do a subsurface lawn, I'd be recommending you go down that path. Uh, there were chemicals getting in installed called Treflan through kind of like the early 2000s. That chemical's been banned in the EU now and I can see it going the same way here. So there's less and less people doing that. You're also adding a chemical um, into your system. So you have to then get a lot of backflow prevention. So it becomes quite costly. Uh, obviously the advantage of subsurface is that if we have a, another water restrictions and they start banning sprinklers, then you can still water your lawn using your subsurface if that's allowed. Um, one good thing about the MP rotator, you, do you know what I'm talking about when I say MP rotator? The sprinkler, do, are you aware of it? Uh, that finger spray? Yeah, they yep, 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 yep. The MP rotator is watermark approved. So every time we've had water restrictions in the past, they've either had rebates for watermark approved products or they've allowed you to use them. So the shower heads that have the eight litre a minute uh, rubber in there to stop water from coming out, they're watermark approved because they've got that restriction. The MP rotators were watermark approved because they're a measurable amount of water delivered over a certain amount of square metres. So it's less likely as a consumer for you to waste water if you forget to turn it off. It's a shitty way of thinking about it, but the, I, I, from what I can understand, they're basically going, if someone turns on MP rotators and on, on their tap and forgets them for four hours, it's going to be one quarter as bad as if they did it with a, with a standard pop-up because they're delivering one quarter of the, hour, uh, the water per hour. You decide which way we're going to go. Most people these days are doing pop-ups in their lawns with MP rotators and drip tube in their gardens spaced at 0.3 or 0.4. All right, so when I say, actually, how are you, mate? All good? No, nah, cool. Sorry. So yeah, all of this plastic and these cutters, you can take home. If you take the MP rotator home, radio will charge you at the door. <laughs> but this is all for you to take, all the plastic and the cutters. Um, those cutters, I don't know how industrial they are and how many hours of irrigation you'll get through with them. I'd be keen to know if you do, yeah, if tomorrow, if tomorrow at 10 o'clock they're not working, trade community, you're, a, you're an asshole. thanks for the free shit. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, definitely publicly shame me. But they're made by Antelco. Antelco, um, I think they're more of a residential product. We've obviously got other cutters that we sell that you would be using for cutting pipe that are going to last. I mean, we've, I've got cutters here, those black ones that he's holding. I obviously, we opened the shop 10 years ago. We still have the original cutters. So obviously we don't do as much work as an irrigation installer, but just to give you an idea, they, they last a long time. So, uh, so you've chosen whether or not you're going to go sprinklers and drip tube. If you're going to go sprinklers residentially, it's not likely you're going to need to put a pressure reducer on your valve. If you do need a pressure reducer on your valve because you're putting MP rotators in and you want to make sure that you've got that exact pressure at the sprinkler so that you can adjust them, you'd be putting either a pressure reducer filter in, which is what these are, or, a, or just a fixed pressure reducer. The pressure reducers need a certain amount of flow in, sorry, a certain amount of pressure coming in for them to reduce. So they are all different. And obviously when this video goes up, I might be corrected online, but if there's not 450 kPa coming into a pressure reducer, it's not gonna do anything. So if you're trying to, if you've got 450 and you're trying to get down to 350, you might struggle. You really need more than that. So if you've got 500 and you wanna get down to 200, that's achievable. But because they're spring, they operate with a spring, they need a certain amount in to send out a certain amount out. Uh, these are good. They've got a little filter inside them as well. So filtration residentially, I'm not a massive advocate for going too crazy on. Um, I've gotta be careful what I say because I'm, there's my opinion and then there's also best practice. If you've got clean water coming into, the water that you're drinking every day and that you're showering with coming into your house, it's very unlikely that you're ever gonna to need to filter it. The only reason that we're putting these filters into systems is if something goes wrong at street level and you've got uh, a pipe has been repaired and then they haven't flushed it or they couldn't flush it and all that debris come into your house, which means it's going into your washing machine, your dishwasher, your fridge, everything else that's hooked up. But if it goes into your drip tube, you're going to have some trouble because if you've got dirt that flushes through all those lines, that's going to have to be dealt with. If you've installed your drip tube properly, you've got a flushing valve at the end and you're happy. But it's just for these, I mean, what are these, 29 bucks or something? So you've got the pressure reducer and the filter all in one. A pressure reducer is going to cost you close to that anyway. So, you know, it's compact. They fit in the box. All good. All drip tube has to have a pressure reducer unless you're getting water pressures at your house close to 250 kPa, which is very unlikely and very unfortunate. If you are, you'd notice having shitty showers and 
you'd like fill up a bath and come back an hour later like there's just nothing happening so it's very likely you'd need that uh, so you've got your pressure reducers you've got your solenoid valves your valves are connected to your controller this here has a backflow prevention device on here these are required not everyone puts them in you should be um, the idea behind them is that they can't water can't go back up the pipe so this is the mains water pipe that's coming off your house if anything gets sucked back through these valves if a blowout happens on the main road and it draws back the water can't come back and go into your house so obviously you're going to stop sucking in any pesticides or fertilizers or dirt that might be in your subsurface back into your drinking water or your showering water or whatever um 40 bucks yeah so it's a pretty i mean it, firstly you meant to but secondly it's also a good peace of mind to know that nothing's coming back this is a basic pressure reduction uh, sorry backflow prevention device it's called a dual check it's just got two spring-loaded um devices in there they are an entry-level backflow up from that so commercially you'll see on in, on the in parks they've got these things that come out of the ground in a cage and then they've got ball, like handles and threads on top of them and then they're a if they're above ground they're an rpz if they're in ground they're a double check so they have higher quality backflow prevention the rpz's actually have a it's a stands for reduced pressure zone if water comes back it blows it out the bottom rather than potentially blowing up the backflow but you're obviously dealing with larger flows and larger pressures so that there's just two of them in line the idea is the water goes through one way but it can't come back the other way so uh, and then we obviously have a ball valve on our manifold so that if anything goes wrong here um, if you're the homeowner you just turn you, you you ring up your local landscape or irrigator and they say look just go turn that ball valve off we'll come out tomorrow we'll sort it out like nothing is ever going to be likely that you need to go out and sort their shit out that night I'm sure there's some high profile and high demand clients that you might have even this should be enough just to turn the valve off or you'll have to go out and turn the valve off for them and charge them and then go back and fix it the next day so yeah and that's it but some people will pay they're like i'm not going outside i'm not taking the valve box off so uh that's down to that point this if anyone's not familiar that's blue line which is a main it's a mains pressure pipe it's flexible um it works with compression fittings at this size once we start i mean you can get electro fusion fittings for that that's a whole nother training session you'll probably never come across that unless you start going into the kind of 50 mil and above uh, just so you're aware it exists the fitting becomes a, a welded fitting that welds using electricity and the plastic melts to each other melts the fittings plastic melts to the pipes plastic using a massive stream of coils in there that heat up using electricity so that's it any questions so far about controllers wi-fi pressure reduction valves manifolds just quickly with programming the controller can you is it worth setting up like seasonal settings uh, I, I traditionally haven't, um, I'm not a good example cause I don't have a, have a lawn or an irrigation system. <laughs> I know. Standard story. The good, the, the good thing is, so if you go down hydro wise, um, beehive, Wi-Fi controllers, they're at a point now where they're communicating quite well with weather stations or, um, or apps. So. I'm pretty sure, so Lynn was at Hunter was saying it, they've now got an algorithm that's pulling the five closest weather data apps. So there might be like Willy Weather and then Bureau of Meteorology and a few others. And then their algorithm works out the likelihood of where you are. So if, if they're pulling from Elizabeth, Paraka, you know, Kent Town, and then you're living in like kind of St. Peter's or whatever, they'll go, well, the, this is the likelihood that that's the weather that's happening there. This is how I understand it. I might be wrong but along those lines and then it'll say and you've set up these pre um rules where you go look if the weather drops below this or the rain goes above this our seasonal adjust has to occur so you'll you'll, you'll enter in what you want it to do on a perfect normal day which is 100 percent, and then it will go down to 80 or 60 or up to 140 so all the seasonal adjust bounces between zero and 200 so you're obviously going to be able to do nothing or two times the amount that you were doing um so you don't really have to think about it as much as you as you might have in the past uh traditionally you like in the in the early 2000s back in the day you'd be able to go out to that client's house in winter and either like push it down to 50 percent and let it water just 50 percent, which doesn't really make sense because you really should be turning it off most of the time um or they just leave it on so um the reason i'm asking is i just set up the rain, one of the rainbow cs uh, rz whatever they are an esp rzx e 
and I had it set to come on at seven o'clock that night, um, and it was pissing me off. Yeah. So the way you would avoid that is to either have a, a rain sensor on the gutter and that the, the rain sensor is a, it interrupts the common. So we don't sell a lot of rain sensors. I don't think they're that good um, because the, the technology in the rain sensor is so cheap. Like it's basically six leather discs that get wet and expand and turn a switch off that are designed to evaporate at the rate that soil should evaporate at and turn back on in a little plastic thing for 30 bucks. So you've got all this technology, you've got all this controller, like hundreds, thousands of dollars, and then it's all dependent on this thing mounted on a gutter under a tree that birds can shit in, catching rain in a hole that big, that's symbolic of the whole house. Like, yeah. you know, so that's why the weather station stuff works better. If you do do that, or basically you put the rain sensor on the gutter, it goes in there and then goes in there and it's just cutting, it's just cutting that. So that little thing that water goes in and cuts off, it just breaks that. So the controller doesn't even know. It just thinks that water's still going, uh, the electricity still passing through that cable, but it's not. And then it evaporates as it's meant to. So you could do that. You could have a Wi-Fi dongle connected to it and you could become the master or the, the homeowner becomes the master of the irrigation system and you can become the slave. So you've got access to it, but they can delete you at any time. They can then go, it's raining off for three days, four days. So you, you've got that feature to say, I don't want to water for three days and it will just go back to normal. So you don't have to go back and go, oh shit, how long has it been? Like it just counts its three days out and then it starts again as if it was back to that point. Um, or you can have it hooked up to the weather data and it will change for you. So it'll say either we've had that much rain, don't water for a long time based on the, the information you've told it or we're expecting. I don't think it, it works on past data, not current data. So it will only act on what's happened, not what's meant to happen. Obviously, it's weather forecasting is not safe. Does that answer that? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Questions about that? Cool. Irrigation controller program. Um, yeah, the Wi-Fi dongle is a good feature. Like it's technology we didn't have available to us two or three years ago, four years ago. Um, you know, as a as a landscape contractor or an irrigation contractor or a building contractor, you know, there's an opportunity there for guys to go out and, um, and girls, I say guys, that's everyone, um, to go out there and have a business where they say, look, we'll manage your whole irrigation for you for 30 bucks a month. Every time something changes, we'll adjust it for you. Like you're, you're not adjusting it, it's adjusting. With the hydro wires, it can send you faults and you'll be like, as part of that, if there's a fault, We'll come to your house, um, we'll assess the fault, we'll send you a, an estimate for what it's going to cost to fix and we'll fix it if you give us the go ahead. Like there's so much you can do now that no one's doing. Like these are business ideas that no one's doing. Well, not no one, but minimal amount of people because the technology's only just come, become available to a market that ha wasn't used to having it. So now you can say, oh, well, this is great. We'll just start putting hydrowisers in every house. We've got flow sensors, we've got this, we've got that. If anything goes wrong, we go fix it. We're saving our client water. So the 30 bucks or the 50 bucks a month that you're charging them to monitor the irrigation could possibly be saved in water because of what you're doing. And it just creates that kind of stream of revenue that's continuous. So that's all in, controller set up. So now we're getting out to the point where we're putting in irrigation. So I'll talk about drip tube and I'll talk about sprinklers. So I mentioned before about 0.3 and 0.4 drip tube. So when I talk about that, I'm referring to the spacing of the drip tube. So every one of these pieces only has one dripper on it. So I can't use that as, that's got two. All right, cool. So the drip tube that we sell is 13 mil drip tube, which is an Australian size, half inch. Uh, uh, Rainbird we're bringing in a 16 mil drip tube, which was their copper shield, which was a subsurface drip tube that people were using. That drip tube didn't fit standard 13 mil fittings and was a pain in the ass. So this is 13 mil 0.4. So that's got boat drippers. This is an NFM product. It's got boat drippers impregnated into the, the wall of the drip tube. They're 400 mil apart and they deliver 1.6 liters per minute, per hour, per dripper, if you've got the right amount of pressure coming in. So we can work out how much water a lawn needs using those drippers or, or how much it's getting delivered. So you've got a dripper every 400 or a garden and then we space that every three or 400. 
you've probably touched it more than I have. <laughs> um, to water a garden completely without having to think about where you're putting your plants, you'd be putting in a 0.4 by 0.4 or a 0.3 by 0.3 or a 0.4 by 0.3. So you can use the 0.4 drip tube and put them 300 apart or use 0.3 drip tube and put them 400 apart. This drip tube here at 0.3.3 delivers about 17.6 millimetres of equivalent rainfall per hour. 17 mils too much. Um, the reason I know that number is because we've had a council spec come through recently and they spec'd it to be 0.3.3. But they also said that the irrigation system, they, they, the irrigation system can't have more than, it has to be delivering between 10 and 15 millimetres of water per hour. So most irrigation uh, systems, we try to get close to 10 or 12, um, and that's the equivalent rainfall per hour. So uh, a, a turf area might require 25 mil of, rain per of equivalent rainfall per week. We know that if it was watered with this, that we can just multiply, divide the 25 by 17, and then that gives you the hours of time that that drip tube needs to be left on for. Same with the MP, M, sprinkler, so an MP rotator, if you have a look into your little booklets here, you'll go, there's a column that says precip mil per hour, there's a square and a triangle. The square refers to an irrigation system being designed like this, where they're in a square configuration. And the triangle refers to say, doing an, uh, like an oval like that, where they get triangulated across the oval, like that. So they're, they're, that's, what the millimeter, that's what the rainfall works out to. So all the data you need, or all the data we need to be able to help use in, in these booklets, books, internet, YouTube videos. So you're getting say 11 mil an hour on that square. So you can say, cool, 11 mil an hour means that I need to water for 2.2 hours a week to make sure my lawn's good. I'm having a Christmas party. I want it to look better. You know what, 35 mil a week is gonna be good for the month leading up to it. Cool, up your program by 20% or just change the times or whatever it is, but you know the water you've got to work with. The other advantage is that you know that those sprinklers are using 12 liters a minute and that you're now watering for 200 minutes. So you've got 500 thereabouts liters of watering cycle being used. You're doing it all per week so that you know that your water's costing you $2.40 or $3.50 per, uh, per kiloliter. And you can start to work out for your clients or for yourself how much water is being used and how much it's gonna cost. So they can say, look, we want lush green lawns. Um, there's 500 square meters, you're like, look, have you thought about the fact that it's gonna cost you $500 a quarter or a year to water that? Oh shit, no, we hadn't thought about it. Well, if, how, what do you want your lawn to look like? Oh, like Adelaide Oval. Okay, well then it's gonna cost this. And then that gives them the, the opportunity early to make some decisions before you get in and do all the work. And they're like, well, no one told us about the cost of water. Like, you know, I guess it's the guy buying the V8 without thinking about the cost of the fuel. But drippers, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Um, if it's any soil around Adelaide except the sandy and the really clay, we are generally doing 0 0.4, 0 0.4. If you're right on the, on the coast, I'd be getting closer to 0 0.3, 0 0.3 because the water's uh, leaching through the sand profile quicker than it would be on clay. So you, you kind of, um, if you've got your soil profile like that, the drippers should be sitting at the top and they should be kind of doing like a bulb of water they should be touching. Um, obviously if it's sand, it's more likely to kind of just go like that. So that water's joining underneath the ground and that's why we can do something like this and you can tell your clients that they are able to go put plants wherever they want and it's gonna be fine. So if they plant one there, it's getting water. If they plant one right next to a dripper, it's getting water because all that water's spreading out under the ground. Obviously you apply mulch on top of that. It ensures that more water stays in the ground um, you're getting less evaporation, obviously the soil, the plant health and all that's even um, beyond that. 0 0.4, 0 0.4, I think we get close to about 12 mil an hour. So that's, you know, and th this is good information you can take to your client and go, look, um, we, we know we're delivering 12 mil an hour on the, on there, we're doing 11 on the, on the lawns. This is why I haven't just put it on for an hour a week on every station. This is why you've got 50 minutes Monday, Thursday, and Saturday on your lawn. And this is why you've got 45 minutes on your gut because there's that minute difference, but we don't want to waste your water. We want to do the right thing by you. We've set it up for you. If you've got any problems, call us. So that's the drip tube. Drip tube being 13 mil means that we can install it using standard Antelco fittings. This is an Antelco takeoff adapter. Have you got them in your kit? No. So pass that one around. So when drip tube, I guess took hold in, in Australia, I'm gonna say around 
2004 or thereabouts from my memory. I'm only 15 years in. Yeah, about that. And Telco established these fittings because people were installing these, these systems using T's. So every piece of, there was a black poly down the side. I should start putting stuff back, shouldn't I? There was black poly down the side. And then they were putting a reducing T into each of these. So they were using that and pushing the 13 mil onto the T and then they had every bit on a T, on a T, on a T, on a T. It was a pain in the ass. It was strong, but as soon as you had a curve, you're trying to curve poly and whatever else, they designed those takeoff adapters so that you could punch them into the top of, of inch poly. Punch tool, he's going to get one. He's already ahead. Let's see if that's what he's doing. All right, so what we... With the drip tube, yep. you're talking about the sand stuff, what about if it was red clay? Then you go 0.5, 0.5, because the water, it's just sitting on top of the surface. Yeah. Or you water it by pulse watering. So you'll say that you were going to do an hour a day, but you're going to do it over two half an hour cycles, five hours apart. So it gives it time to soak in and then time to soak in. You do the same thing on a hill, on a slope. So if you're, this is just, most of you know me, I'm going to go everywhere. Um, if you're on a slope, you want to lay your pipe across the slope, not down the slope, so that the water doesn't catch the pipe and run. So you want it to basically, so the slope's like that and you're like that, so the water just drops straight. And then, so, and then you want to cut your watering cycle times down so that it gives it time to soak in. It's called cycle and soak. Most controllers have the cycle and soak feature built into the controller. So if you've got a sloped area, you can go, cool, cycle and soak that one, and it takes care of it for you. This is a punch tool used with those elbows. So has, who hasn't used this? Punch tool and elbow. You, you, have you done one before? All right, I'm gonna let you all do one so that you know what it feels like and what it looks like. Reedy, can you get, oh, sorry, I got a few here. So what we would do if I was installing, if I was installing a, a garden bed, I'd get my pegs and I'd put down my header pipe on each side, have my end pieces and my air release valves and my flushing valves and whatever else I needed on my header pipe and they're solid, they're not going anywhere because they're pegged every whatever, one meter, two meters. Then I would get either on my own or with an assistant, uh, a roll of pipe. I'd stick this elbow into the pipe, cut cleanly. That one's not cut really that well. Let's test out your new tool. You got one open? Oh, look at that. Come on, Billy. <laughs> you nearly. You could sell it on eBay. I reckon that would. There we go. Look at that. Clean cut. Um, so push that into there for me. Not because I'm weak. So, no, the other way. Yeah, put that one there. So these fittings that are made by Antelco were designed not to be used with clips. I recommend you use them with clips because it's a safety, but they're that good that at the right pressure, these will never ever come out. So provided you've got your pressure reduction in there. So you've got that there. Where that drip is sitting as far as that does not matter because gravity is going to take over. If the drip is pointing up, the water will go down. If the drip is pointing down, the water will go down. So you've got that. The person that's helping is rolling out the drip tube. So when we do that, you want to basically roll the drip tube off the roll uh, the same way it's gone on. So someone's holding it and you're walking back doing this or similar, because if you just throw it down and start pulling it out, you'll get that pigtail and then you're just continuously trying to work it out. So however you do that, you could, you work it out. So that's in. We're going to punch a hole in this tube in this without putting a hole in our hand. So that there is what you want to achieve. You don't want it to go through that side. So no. one side only. Then you push that into there. So I'll get you to punch yourself a hole so you know what it feels like. They, those holes need to be a round hole, not an oval hole. So you want to try and keep the, the shape of that pipe not egg shaped so you want to try and support it as much as you can you won't go through the other side i won't no <laughs> no because as soon as it pops you'll pull back so so you want to basically come back off the edge a bit do you yeah oh yeah i didn't get that at all and then shove that in i'll give you guys so you've done this haven't you a hundred yeah. times there you go show me how strong you are so that into there. Yep. I should have organised the site and charged them to do irrigation and got you guys to come out there. And then now you sh you you show me how to do. Well, it's, it's no, it's free training. You show me how to do it out there. 
that's it. So as you'll see there, that's in, yeah. right? You'll yeah, be able to rip it out. Yeah, it's just locked in. But now you've got a curved lawn. That's all cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you can. So you're going to replicate that. You have to do it. And then you peg your drip tube down, backfill it with loam, all that jazz, or put mulch over the top of it. If it's under lawn, you want at least 100 mil of loam and lawn above your drip tube so that you encourage root growth down to the drip tube. If you're planning on, or if the client's planning on coring that lawn at any point, I'd be recommending 150, and 150 is not too deep. So if you've got drip tube 150 below the surface, the roots will get down there. It's obviously just going to require an establishment period of overhead watering initially. Please don't stab each other. Show me. Good size. Yeah, so that's not as clean. So see that, see these holes? <coughs> see how that, that's what you want it to look like. See, so that means, is it? Yep. You made that with the other end. Yeah. Done pretty well. So obviously when, when these, these will be on the ground, right? Yeah. So you're, do it like now. Because obviously you've got the ground underneath supporting it. Keep going, you're nearly there. Don't worry about my tablecloths, these are brand new. <laughs> it's, I ha you have to do it because this is an equal opportunities workplace. <laughs> All right, you keep going. Um, anyway, so you get the gist of it. Pump, punch that in, clip those. I used to clip a lot of those elbows at the end um, so that I could pull the clip around so it wasn't sitting up because obviously if your clip's sitting up, you've got it closer to the surface. Um, it's you guys will work out your own way to do it. What time is it? Three o'clock. All right. So that's your drip tube. You get all that in. You run the pipe back to the valve. Put the pipe on the valve. Clip the valve. Turn it on. Make sure it works. Cover it with loam or mulch. Charge your customer. Go home. They pay you five hundred days later. Is that how it works? <laughs> Not the good ones. Uh, sprinklers will be. Um, you'll be using either a two inch, a three inch or a four inch body. I've got a few different size bodies here. Um, just to give you the idea, the bodies all cost the same. So you can buy a two inch, a three inch or a four inch. It all costs the same. Don't you hurt yourself. I don't mind if these guys hurt themselves. I need you to work. <laughs> I just imagine that. Hey, Ron. Yeah, one of you guys just went to hospital, cut himself. Not going to be at work tomorrow. So that punch tool that you just used there. Yep. That's for four mil stuff, so the, 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 these little ones, yeah, the but ones. similar thing. Three inch, four inch, two inch, doesn't matter. The idea is that if you use a two inch, you're gonna have trouble if your lawn is cut any longer than that. So if you've got a Santa Ana or a winter green and you're gonna use a cylinder mower on it and it's gonna be looked after and mowed every three days and you're gonna be happy that it's gonna be looked after, two inch. If you're gonna put a buffalo grass or similar in and your clients going to mow it when they get around to it or just before Christmas. You want to go four inch and then three inch if you have something in between and you really don't feel like digging that extra inch, <laughs> this, is, this is your product. So these fittings, these sprinklers need to be installed plus a fitting. So be aware of that when you're digging your holes. The fittings are threaded. Do not ever thread tape a sprinkler. So that thread goes straight into the base of the sprinkler. No thread tape ever. Uh, it doesn't need it, um, and the potential damage that'll occur is worse than any leak that might occur. So it's not, it's not going to leak. If it does, it's going to drip water into an area you're trying to water. Yeah. If you put thread tape in it and it spirals off, especially with gear-driven sprinklers, it can suck the thread tape into the sprinkler and damage the sprinkler. So it's just, it doesn't need it. It's not done. Have, I mean, you get a feel for how tight that is. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you, they're kind of just tighter than... It's hard to explain that, hey. Like how would you explain how tight you do a sprinkler up? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Until it feels right. It feels right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, this is just one of those things you just have to feel. But you, even if you screw that all the way down, it's not going to break. But you don't need to go tighter than that. Yeah, yeah. So the sprinklers that we've got here, uh, they've got this, the one we're looking at here is a body and you just add a head to it. So at the moment, this has got a, a Hunter 10, uh, 10A on it, which is 10 foot adjustable, 10 foot radius adjustable arc. We could take that off and put in an MP rotator. So the sprinkler's already in the ground, it's buried, it's not working anymore, the water pressures, water flows change, we can't do anything about it. Those sprinklers use three litres a minute, these use one and a half litres a minute. We'll just change out all the heads, done. 
fix your customer's problem. The, you can, they used to make them as a fixed sprinkler, which you wouldn't be able to do what I've just done. These are available two, three, and four. The fours are available as f um, with uh, pressure, reduction, pressure reducing stems or pressure regulating stems. So there's actually a fitting inside the shaft of the sprinkler that reduces the pressure coming to the head. So if you didn't put a pressure reducer here, you could actually put it at each sprinkler and then that'll give you the right amount of pressure to the head and then the head can adjust to suit. Talk to us about that if you need to. Sprinklers, I've got this set up so we can put one in. Obviously, you want the sprinkler to be below the edge. I don't know how that looks from there, but you want to be able to, there. So you want to be able to have it there so that it pops up past the lawn. The idea isn't that it sits there the whole reason that they pop up is so they can pop up past the height of your lawn, uh, especially when you've got four inch pop-ups. You're better off putting these in too low than too high. Uh, so then you can obviously maintain them. Otherwise you're just gonna keep chopping MPs off. An MP head's gonna cost your clients 15 to $17 if they walk in here and buy one. They do enough of them, they're gonna be pretty upset. Um, I don't know what, there's not much else to cover with that. Cut your poly pipe straight, clip it up. Um, one important thing, these are uh, called a side outlet elbow. They're designed to get right into a corner. Um, some people will choose to run a T past a corner and elbow in. So if you can imagine, instead of having that on, on, a, on that, you'd have it screwed onto a plain elbow and then the T would be there. And so if you've got, say, some haunching that you guys have done and you can't get right in, you just want to get a mattock and just smash that haunching so that you can just get that sprinkler right in rather than sitting at 200 off because you don't want to disturb the haunching or you can't be bothered or whatever the situation is. If you can just get enough kind of 20 or 30 mil to get that in the sprinkler in, maybe 50 mil, um, you can get that right in and the T can sit out here. So you can just swoop past it and, and get that in. Another advantage of using these over the side outlet elbows is if you've got uh, really hard soil and no accessibility and you want to dig, you can probably dig slightly shallower than the sprinkler and then start to move your way down once you're getting to the sprinkler so that you've got your depth but you haven't had to trench 250 or whatever it might be along the whole way. So I guess your sites will probably be a bit different, won't they? Because they're like the whole site's being dug out. What's the majority of the work that you're doing is existing gardens? Yeah. Yep. So this is the kind of stuff that you're going to run into where you're like i don't want to dig <laughs> or, or there's tree roots or whatever yeah, yeah. like these side outlet elbows are just a perfect situation fitting where you're not always going to have it an, a, an air a flushing valve is just a little tap have you got any in your bag nut it flushes you just open the tap blow all the water out it flushes any debris you'd usually put the flushing valve at the end of the line or at the lowest point and it would just flush it out uh yeah that there sits on a fitting, water rushes in underneath it and it hits the O-ring, closes it off. You have to Teflon it off? Oh, yes, you do Teflon them. You don't have to actually, same deal. It's not gonna leak. So um, I wouldn't actually, because the risk you've got with Tefloning them is that if any thread tape falls down below there and stops that rubber from sealing when it closes. Yeah, so th this is what we would use as a flushing valve. There's your cobra tool, you can have a shot on that. Um, we just have that at the end of the system, blow the water out and close it off and it's done. And you could come out and seasonally flush that system. So you could say, I'll come out at the start of spring, we'll check that everything's working, we'll flush the system, you know, and you put that in an email, like this is what you're getting with your seasonal check for 199 bucks or whatever it is. We allow to fix a couple of clips, we'll flush it. it you know, there's a lot of detail there, but you know. Um, so that's flushing air release valve. Valve boxes, uh, they're pretty simple. Obviously that's a valve box. Valve boxes are like sprinklers. They're not designed to sit above the level of the surface. Um, they don't make brown ones yet to match your mulch. Uh, green is as good as it gets. There are other colors, but I think it's like black and beige. Uh, residential valve boxes are about 150. Commercial are about 300. So you'll see big valve boxes up there. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I hope I've covered everything. Um, every time I do one of these, it's completely different to the one I've done before. So sometimes I'll forget stuff. Obviously you guys know you've got access to us and me at any time. You can ring the shop, you can ask questions on the trade community, you can message me direct on Facebook, you can email me, I don't really care, we'll always get back to you. Um, I'll stay around for another 10 minutes if there's anything that you guys wanna ask individually that you weren't happy to ask in front of other people. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, and that is it, you are excused. <laughs> cool.